Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that Elohim is the title our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any letters or characters in the alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, making such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings of the true and original name of our Father and His Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state He is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape or form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a superincorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, the self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plain as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should all ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plain? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface to the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called a divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school we show proof how that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Also in this school we have ten primary constitutional aims and objectives and they are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures 
comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there's no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of a mortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. <clears throat> we'll have class dedicated this evening in prayer by Dr. Lawrence Edwards followed by our scripture reading, which is Proverbs, um, the 30th chapter, verses, verse 4, um, which will be read by Dr. Pam, Pamela Turner. Let's give thanks to our Heavenly Father Yahweh for allowing us to come together once again. We hope that something that will be said in this, in this class to edify and beat is somebody, someone in here. Because this is the only way we can have salvation. Yahweh has brought us together just so we can know, give, give us a plan of, uh, to think about his plan and, and the actions that he has taken. And this is the only way we will have salvation. With those few words, let us all say. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll be reading from the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by A.B. Trina of the Scripture Research Association. And this is Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou knowest it? And that's Proverbs 30 and 4. Okay, I'd like to take a moment and um, announce and acknowledge and welcome our visiting brethren with us. We have visiting with us from um, the first time. Patricia and Michael Morelli. Maserati. I'm sorry? Maserati. 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 That's okay. I just wrote down what they wrote. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and um, visitor, a brothering visitor with us from Orlando branch, Dr. Julieta Garcia. Okay, welcome. And we, um, class will last approximately two hours, and we ask that if you have any questions, please write them down and approach the speakers after class. <clears throat> and our first speaker this evening will be Dr. Julieta Garcia. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, just broke it. Um, 
It is indeed a pleasure to be in the Tampa class today. Um, I thank my Heavenly Father Yahweh for allowing me to be here. Um, I was working in the area and the Father said, go to class. So um, there's one thing that we're going to learn here when you sit here for a period of time and is that it's better to be obedient than to be disobedient. Um, so when the Father puts something in your heart, it, it's, it's, um, it's something that cannot be ignored. Um, to our new visitors, welcome. You're amongst friends. You're going to find out that if you keep coming to class, the people that you have met here today um, become family. Um, I've been part of this school for some 25 some years, and I tell you what, I can honestly say my true family is, is, is those that, that we can see eye to eye, that can understand the gospel, and that would just leave everything just to make sure that you understand the truth. Because this teaching or this gospel, let me say it that way, is nothing to play with. We're talking about your eternal life. We're talking about your soul salvation. And sometimes, you know, you, you, you go on to live life every day. You know, you go to work. You deal with the family. You deal with the children um, and the problems and the things. And you get wrapped up in that stuff. Um, but sometimes you got to hold yourself back and say, Father, what, what am I doing? What, what, what are you doing with my life? What's going to happen to my soul, right? Um, I remember that um, my first time when it was announced that we had new visitors, I thought about my first time. And my first time, I was like, oh, my goodness, what I got myself into again, right? You look at these charts, and you say, oh, my gosh, I am what I did again, right? But then we come to understand that these charts are just your Bible in pictorial form. And this is just the events that have taken place in your Bible. And so from a natural standpoint, I'm a uh, human resource manager. My job is to teach my employees how to perform their job correctly. And in order for them not to get fired, <laughs> They have to follow policies and procedures, right? In order for them to, um, to do their job the correct way and to get promoted, they have to learn how to do their job. And so here, all you're going to see is the Bible in pictorial form because there are different types of learners. Some will learn by hearing. Some will learn by seeing. Others will learn by touching, right? That's just from a natural spin. That's, that's how it is. Um, so that is why you see these charts. But everything in here is in your Bible. Because sometimes when you look at it, it makes sense, right? And when I came to class the first time and I looked around, I said, oh, my gosh. I don't got myself in trouble again. Where am I, right? But the first time, for the first time in my life, my questions were answered. In one class, I had more questions answered than I had in, the entire, in my entire life. And I thank the Father because he has allowed me to stay in class, right? And um, that's just by the mercy of the Father. So in here, you're going to see this is, this, this is the dispensations chart, and this is just talking about the ages and dispensations of how the Father has, has his purpose set up. <clears throat> this is called the green chart, and then here's your tabernacle pattern, which you have your tabernacle, which is in, in, uh, in the book of Exodus, and then you have your body, how it correlates with the pattern. Everything, so let me go back. When the moderator was up here, she said that Yahweh is all in all. There's nothing outside of your heavenly father, right? So if he is all in all, everything abides in him. Everything has to match. Everything has to be lined up. And here we have the Moses chart where you see Moses. You probably recognize who we used to think it was Jesus, truly Yahshua. And then in here you have your... Um, 
your elementary chart, right? And I'm sorry, my, your charts are a little different. Um, and here you see you see Joshua with the carnal audiences, and um, and here you have um, the Aya Asher Aya um, chart also. Now I'm gonna I'm not gonna be here long. I'm, I'm telling you, I came to eat because um, I am hungry for the gospel. Um, there's a scripture that says that there's gifts given. My gift is to be a listener. Um, and I know that and I understand that. And um, I'm going to relinquish the floor and I'm going to allow this precious time to be given to somebody that will be able to go in detail um, about this gospel. Thank you. And our next speaker this evening will be Dr. Charles Marshall. <laughs> I'm down before I hit you in the head. Thank you. My name is Charles Marshall. Now that's important to me, like your name is important to you. The only reason I knew that I was supposed to get up here was because they called my name. Right. <laughs> now, I'm married to a nice looking young lady there. First thing I wanted to know about her when I met her was what was her name. Now, she gave me the correct name. That was her problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But if she'd have gave me a false name, that would have told me that she wasn't interested and to take a hike. So names are important. Your name is important. My name is important. Get me uh, uh, Romans 1, 19 and 20, please. Because what we do down here is quite different than what you're going to see most of your, well, none of your other religious organizations. We can show you how that there is a tabernacle, okay, that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, and that this is the pattern of everything in the universe. In actual reality, this is a representation of the pattern because the pattern is actually Yahweh Elohim. Now, I'm going to get in that na into those names. Or, or as, as I knew before I came down here, as Lord or God, okay? He's the actual pattern, but we'll get into all that stuff because there's so much. But you see, we can take the things of the creation, okay, and show you according to this pattern and show you how everything in the creation agrees, and not only agrees, but proves the existence of a creator. That's different. They say that science and religion don't agree. Well, they don't understand religion, and they don't understand science. Because it does agree. Yahweh created it so that we would know. Would you read that please? Romans 1, 19 and 20. Romans 1 and 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. Mm -hmm. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. What this is saying is we have no excuse for understanding and knowing our Creator because the creation is trying to teach you and tell you something about Yahweh, all right, your Creator. And one thing is a name. Now, I had been to a few religious organizations before I came down here, and I did not know the name. That's been over 40 years ago. I did not know the name. The names were not as common as they are now, even though they still don't really teach them in the churches. Okay. Now, Yahweh is the most important thing there is in the whole creation because he created the creation. You understand? So now, if my name's important to me, it seems to me that his name should be important to him. Let's see what, let's see what the Bible says about that. Okay. Get me Exodus, please. Uh, Three and... Uh, Exodus uh, 3. 
I'm going to start at 1. What's that? <clears throat> start at 1. Yeah, if you would. We're just established. Well, no, let's wait. I'm going to cut through the chase because we... You see, when you go to church, if you went to church, two hours would be a long time. Down here, two hours is not very long. Because you're trying to explain and give out as much information as you can in, in, in an actual short period of time. I've been down here for over 40 years, and I'm still learning when I come to class. So it, it's, you know. Moses, okay, was born in Egypt, all right? He, he, became, he was in Pharaoh's household. Okay, he saw a Hebrew, okay, uh, an Egyptian killing a Hebrew, and he killed that man. Okay, he had to flee for his life. Now, think about this. He was in Pharaoh's household, so the person he killed must have been pretty important for Pharaoh to get mad. You understand? So, he flew, he was up here, he got married, okay, he was tending sheep on the backside of Mount Sinai when he comes across a phenomenal sight. Okay, now then. So, I think that would be two. And the angel of... You want me to use, uh, uh, just read it like it would be in the King James okay. for now, please. Appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. So he was tending sheep, and he comes across a phenomenal sight. If you saw a bush, and it was burning, and it wasn't turning to ashes, you would take a second look, too. You see, so he looks at this, and there's an angel that starts talking to him out of this bush. Okay, read. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. Mm -hmm. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside. Now we've got an angel. we got the Lord. Okay, read. When he saw that he turned aside to see, God called. Now we got God. Wait a minute. <laughs> Who we got in here? Read. See, because what man has done, man has went in there and changed those names and put titles in there. Okay? And if you understand, and once you're around for a while, once, anywhere in the Old Testament that you see Lord, nine times out of ten, it's Yahweh. When you see God, nine times out of ten, it's Elohim. Okay? And when you see Jesus... 100% of the time, yeah. it's Yahshua. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? It's just that simple. Okay? But they substitute it. And we can get into a long, drawn-out thing of why Lord's in there and God's in there and so on, but I, we want to keep going here. Read. All right. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. Okay, now, so here is Moses. Okay, he says, Here am I. Now, what he is going to do is he's going to send Moses into Egypt to liberate the children of Israel down here who are slaves and in bondage. Okay, because he said he has heard their cry. So he's going to send him down. But before, Mo but before Moses goes down there, jump down to about 12 there or so, because he's going to ask a question. And this is a question that I never thought to ask. You know, tell you the truth, Moses didn't either. Yahweh put it within him to ask the question, but we won't get into that. Okay, read. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? Now then, what is his name? Now the reason why Moses is asking this question is because down here in Egypt they are polytheistic. They have many, many gods. They had a god for just about everything. Pharaoh himself was considered a god, a descendant of the sun god Ra. Okay, so down here they all had names. So he's going to say, well, which god? Because remember, they've been down here some 400 years. Okay, read. What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Now, in actual reality, he said, Aya, Asher, Aya, which means, actually, I will be what I will to be. If he, I am, he's po like Popeye the sailor man. I am that I am. He's Popeye. That's all he can be. You see, but I will be what I will to be, okay, he can be whatever he wishes. And he demonstrates that by Moses throwing down his rod, turning into a serpent, putting his hand into his bosom. It was leprous. Pulled it out, it was leprous, put it back in, and he made it whole again. Right. So he will be what he wills to be. And your creator's name, Aya, Asher, Aya, that is one of the meanings. Okay? 
He who causes to breathe. He who causes to exist. I will be what I will to be. Read. See, the world has a puny creator. You understand? The, the creator is actually all-powerful. Very powerful. He can be what he wills. To, he willed to be this creation. It's here. You see, I know these are fantastic things that I'm saying, but just keep listening and coming back, and they will all be shown and proven to you. Okay, read on, please. And he said, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am that I, I am hath sent me unto you. Mm -hmm. And God said moreover unto Moses. Okay, you can use your, oh, no, he hasn't given the name. Go ahead. No. Uh, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Now, he didn't say Lord, and he didn't say God. Lord, if you look up Lord, it comes from a Phoenician deity, Baal. And Yahweh told the children of Israel he didn't want that name coming out of their mouth. So what they did is they took Baal, changed it to Lord, okay? You've got a house of, there's all kinds of lords. You've got a house of lords. You've got landlords. That's not, you know, there's only one Yahweh. Right. There's only one I will be what I will to be. You see, you're putting limitations on him. You understand? And Lord, if you look, goes way down the line because you've got kings and princesses and, you know, on down, and lords on down the line, Okay. What he said was Yahweh, okay? And he said something that's very important here. See, now, we don't ask you to do like we did when we went to church. Believe me, brother, I've been sent by God. We don't go over that, you see. We want people to do research. We want you to make sure that what's being said down here is true. Because like, like was said in the prayer, your eternal life is at stake here. Now, I know we don't think about that a lot with our day-to-day, -day, but your eternal life is at stake. Now, if he says that his name is Yahweh, if it is truly Yahweh, and this is his name forever, and it's a memorial into all generations, what gives man the right to go in and change that? Now, you can't find any place in this book where he said anything about changing his name or calling him what you want. You see, but you're going to find that name once you start understanding. You're going to see that name again and again and again. Now, we've got a holy name Bible that we use in this class. Nothing to do with us. You understand? It's got the names in it. I've got a Bible back there that is not the holy name Bible. Okay? And it's got the names in it. So there are people out here that know and do publish those names. You see, this isn't something new. As a matter of fact, this is, this is the old name, Yahweh, and this is the new name or title, Lord. Because Lord is a title. It can, also can be a name. Jack Lord, remember him? Mm -hmm. You see? So, but it's false. Okay, now then, get me... Uh, now, one thing they're going to say, get me Psalms. Uh, I can't... I can never remember scriptures, and when I get up here, I really can't remember we scripture. Got a bunch of them here. There's a few of them. There's uh, seven lame. Seven lame was dur as long as the sun. Seven. Okay. Okay. Now, one of the things that I've been told by different people is the name's been lost. Okay. It doesn't matter what you're calling. The people aren't ready for it yet. All kinds of excuses. I don't know. Evidently, when he gave his name to Moses back here, he thought the people were ready for it. That's all I can say, you see. Now, have you got Psalms? Yeah, Psalms 72 and 17. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun. So his name is not lost, you see. When the minister told me that one, I, right there, go to Psalms 70. You know, it shows you right there. That's what I'm trying to show you. That what we're trying to do down here is show you and prove to you. Now then, another thing I'm going to tell you to do is when you read the, a verse that we've gotten here, when you get home, look above it, look below it. Mm -hmm. Make sure we're not taking it out of context because I've seen that done many, many, many times. Okay, so check it out and see. Okay, so now then his name is Yahweh. Now then, this name, Elo, this is a title, Elohim. Mm -hmm. 
It's a title that Yahweh gave to himself. Now, Yahweh, Elohim, more accurately describes him than God. This, is a, this comes from a German deity. Okay, we, sometimes we can get in detail on this. Okay, this comes from a German deity. This is the one that Yahweh gave for himself. Now, the one reason mankind doesn't use Elohim is because they don't understand it. It's a plurality. All right? Now, they don't understand that because it's one God, and then they try to say there's three, but it's all one and all kinds of stuff. We'll get into that sometime too. You understand? But they don't understand that. When he, Yahweh is both masculine and feminine. Right within himself, he can bring forth creation. Like the A here in Yah, Yahweh, Adam, E for Eve. Now in Hebrew, it's only four letters. Okay, Yad, Te, Vav, Te. It doesn't have the A and the E. We have to put those in there to pronounce, to pronounce the name. It makes it more pronounceable for, in English because we do use vowels. You know, I learned all this since I came down here because when I was in school, I didn't pay attention to any of that stuff. I had to learn all this stuff when I came down here. When I was in school, I had, I had no incentive to learn anything. When I came down here, all of a sudden, I had an incentive to learn. I learned English, and I learned science, and I learned about the physical body. And I learned all these things simply because now I had a reason. Now, you know, it meant something to me. When I was in school, it didn't mean nothing to me, you see. So you can come down here and even get good education. You know, Yahweh, okay, Elohim, more accurately describes him because he's both masculine and feminine. In Genesis, I'm not going to get it, but in Genesis it said he created Adam in his own image. Male and female created he them, all right? Now, he created Adam in his own image because before Eve was taken out, he was both masculine and and feminine. You see, once you start understanding these things, and when you start understanding these names and titles, it gives you a better understanding of your creator also. Okay? Now then, let's go to Yahshua. Okay? Get me uh, John. Get me uh, Matthew. Get me Matthew. Uh, get me John first, please. Okay. John 5.43, ain't it? Okay. John 5.43. Now this is important. Now, I want, you to, I want you to go up just a little bit. I want you to go there where the angel uh, Gabriel came to. Uh, oh, no, that's the next one. This is John. Okay, just read John. Okay. Um, John 5 and 43, I am come in my Father's name. And if ye receive me not, another, I'm oh, sorry, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. Now then. Remember when I got up here and I said something about a name and how that you could look at the physical creation to understand something about your creator. All right. Now, my father's name was Marshall. My first name when I was born was Marshall. I had a tag on me, Marshall. My parents argued for a few days over what my other name was going to be. Okay, but I was baby Marshall. That was my first name. I came in my father's name. You see how this works? You see how the creation is showing forth and backing up, you see, theology of all things, you see. So I came in my father's name. He said he come in his father's name. The first portion of his father's name is Yah. The first portion of his son's name, Yahshua, is Yah. Okay, now I'm going to get into this a little bit, but you can see the similarity in the name. Okay, now then, get me uh, Matthew. All right, Matthew 121. And she shall bring forth a son. No, jump up, please. I want to. I want to show. This is the name of Yahshua was so important that Moses here, an angel appeared to Moses. It was actually Yahweh, Yash, Yahweh Elohim, appeared to Moses here and told him his name. And then he was to take that name. He was to go down here into Egypt and he was to liberate or bring salvation, save them from the slavery and the conditions that they were in down here, okay, take that name and go down there and liberate them, all right? Now then, read. So do you want to start the birth of Yahshua or the uh, dream? Or? Uh, start where he, the angel comes to, uh, to uh, uh, Mary. 
That's 20. But while he thought on these things, well, let me go up to 19. Okay. 18. 18. Now the birth of Yahshua the Messiah was on this wise. When as his mother Miriam was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Now they were just engaged. They had not been together yet. And all of a sudden she's pregnant. Now, there's a problem here. Okay, read. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Mm -hmm. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Miriam thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now this isn't her child, it isn't his child. Okay, it says in the book that she conceived in the womb. You conceive in the fallopian tubes. You know, it's not the womb. Minor. But still, you're going to find out that when this book says something, it says it for a reason. Mm -hmm. These are not just <coughs> words that are randomly placed in there, you see, but they mean something. Now, this is the Holy Spirit's, and this is not Mary. Okay, read. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yahshua. Now, they're going to call his name Yahshua. Now, this is the angel Gabriel. Yahweh thought it was so important to name Jesus. No, it wasn't Jesus. Right. <laughs> to name Yahshua. Yahshua, he thought it was so important, he sent an angel down to tell them what to name the child. They didn't have a choice. Right. You see, Mary and Joseph didn't have to argue, you understand, over the name. This is what the name's going to be. Now then, if Yahweh considers it important to tell you what to name something, I would say that it's pretty important. And then somebody comes along and decides, nah, we're going to name him Jesus. Now here's another thing about the name Jesus. It was impossible for that name to be Jesus. And the reason why it was impossible for that name to be Jesus is there's no J or J sound in Hebrew, Latin, Greek. It didn't even come into existence into the English language until about 400 years ago. When Columbus sailed the ocean blue, they did not call his name Jesus. You see? They didn't call him Yahshua either because it had been changed to Isus, Isus and Isus, you understand. But there could not be a J or a J sound. His name had to be Yahshua. Now then, it said, read that again, Where uh, the reason why they named him Yahshua. And, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yahshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. So you see, the name Yahshua... Whoops, when in conjunction with Shua, means Yahweh is salvation or Yahweh is liberation. Right. Now you're going to find here in this class that when we say that something is like this, you're going to be able to find it back in the Old Testament. And the reason why is because Yahshua told the disciples and his followers that if they wanted to know about him, that they had to go to the scriptures because the scriptures were all about him. You understand? See, I used to go back there. Well, basically, I was told that we were New Testament Christians. I, I knew very, very little about the Old Testament. You see, but yet Yahshua says, if you want to know about me, you've got to go back to the Old Testament. Go back to Moses and the prophets. Now, if you go back to Moses and the prophets, he gave his name Yahweh. And when he gave Moses that name Yahweh, Moses went down here with that name to Pharaoh, declared that name to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said, I've never heard that name before. Who is this Yahweh? Well, he found out who he was. Okay. Declared his name down here, and that name was their liberation or their salvation. Showing forth that Yahshua is liberation or salvation. It's just that simple. It's nothing hard. And... I, when I first came down here, I was amazed. I, I, I couldn't believe that these were the true names and nobody had never told me about them. That all the religious organizations I looked into, they didn't tell me about them. And then when I would go and ask them, they would come up with all kinds of excuses. Uh, people ain't ready for it. It doesn't matter what you call him. 
Well, if it doesn't matter why, what you call him, then why don't you call him by his right name, by his true name? You know, if you want to show respect, you call somebody by their proper name. You see, if I was if I was to be kissing my wife and hugging my wife and I called her Janet, I would be in a lot of serious trouble. I think a name is important. Now, we're supposed to be forming a personal relationship with our Creator. When you form a personal relationship with your Creator, it seems to me like the name would be important to you and to Him. You understand? I hope you got something out of that. I I'm, I'm just went through this very quickly, very briefly. We could get into... We can get into each. I, we could spend two. I could spend two hours just on these names. I mean, it's there's so much evidence. There's so much proof. There's just so much. But we want to take and get in some other things and and let you see a little bit about what this teaching's about. Because I'm going to tell you something. When I first came down here, they told me that this teaching was a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kenley. And I want to tell you something that turned me off. Because I'd seen other organizations that said somebody had had a vision. And I'd seen that they were all wet. You see, I could see and find holes in it. Well, there was one thing that they said, that Dr. Kenley said. And Dr. Kenley said, make me prove it to your satisfaction. And that's the difference between this organization and the other organizations you're going to see out here is that we try our hardest. We attempt to do everything we can to prove it to your satisfaction. It's don't believe me, you see. Believe what you, the evidence that you can give. Yahweh, I was told when I was a child that I had to just believe God, and it was a blind belief. But I have found out since I came down here, he has never, ever asked anybody to blindly believe or accept him. He always gives witnesses. He always gives evidence. And that's what we're going to attempt to do, to provide you with those, to, so that you can see the same thing that we see. It is beautiful. It is so beautiful. It's just like the first lady up here was talking about, the first speaker was talking about. This is, is the most beautiful thing you're ever going to find in your life, because it's going to answer your questions. It's going to put your mind at ease, and you're going to finally understand Yahweh for the first time in your life. And that's very important. And with that, I'll sit down and say thank you very much for the opportunity. Hallelujah. And our next speaker for this evening's class will be our dean, Dr. Joel Turner. I didn't expect Chuck to sit down so quickly. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, let's go over to Acts, the 17th chapter. And um, I've been reading Acts all week. And um, you read through Acts. And um, it's called Acts because it's talking about the acts or actions that the apostles did, okay? Particularly Peter and, and Paul. And um, these guys did nothing but declare that name of Yahshua, okay? Wherever they went. And, and Paul traveled all over the place. I mean, the, the travel, I mean, he, and uh, the, the, the things that he endured, um, uh, in one case I was reading that he was taking out he, for, for, for preaching this name of Yahshua he was taken out of the city and this is by his own people the Jews and was stoned until he was dead and other disciples of Yahshua came out to get him and he came out of it okay it says he was dead Okay, with stones. And I guess that happened to him three times. He was uh, uh, given 40 lashes, I think it was four times, save one lash. 
Okay? <laughs> yeah, so he counted them even. You know, and all these things he did, you see, was for, uh, for because he was declaring that name of Yahshua. Okay? It was, it, it, he was willing to give up his life for that name. That's how, uh, you know, and it just, you know, like I said, I've been reading that all week, and it was, they, they would go into a city, and that he would tell them about Yahshua, how he went through a death, burial, and a resurrection, and, 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 and uh, uh, preach really the same things that we're teaching down in this class. And they would, they would uh, many would accept it. There was a huge number of people that accepted it at that time. But in almost every city, there would be a group of people that wouldn't accept it. And usually these were the people that were in power. And that there would be a struggle. And uh, uh, he never backed down. He, he never gave up. And uh, in the end, uh, he went back to Jerusalem, even though everybody told him not to. And uh, where he was uh, arrested and... Um, there actually was, even because of the name of Yahshua, the Jews at that time, not, now look, I'm not, bad on, I'm not down on Jews, not down on Catholics. I'm just telling you a little bit of the history of the thing. Okay, because many, many Jews, and Paul was a Jew, believed this gospel. Okay, and when he went to Jerusalem, he immediately was arrested. And there was even a group of uh, Jewish zealots, I think there was 20 of them, that made a pledge that they would not eat until they had murdered Paul because he was declaring this name of Yahshua. And, 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 and you see, there were other things he was declaring too, okay? And, and, and the, to, to protect him, <laughs> the Romans had to have a garrison of 200 men surrounding him, and they had to get him out of Jerusalem, okay, and, and uh, where he was, where he, he went to another Roman uh, uh, leader, and eventually, see, Paul was a Roman citizen, so what happened was, is he was able to appeal to Caesar, and when he did that, they couldn't touch him. And then he went to Rome, and he again preached that name of Yahshua, and there they finally killed him. You see, that's how much he went through just for that name. You know, and it's, it, it, you know, you read through it and you're just like, wow. You know, it's just, just amazing. Okay, now, uh, pick it up at verse, uh, okay, so this is during his, 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 his journeys. Okay, we're just going to pick up the whole thing. Uh, pick it up at 16, 17 and 16. Acts 17 and 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Actually, um, before we do this, let's go over to um, Acts the fourth chapter. Okay, and then we're going to come back to this. All right, read Acts 4. Um, now, this is, this is uh, we're going to get back to Paul, but I want to talk about Peter, too, because Peter did the same thing. He declared the, this name of Yahshua. All right? Now, in the fourth chapter, um, uh, again, uh, p just pick it up at 4 and 1. Uh, Acts 4 and 1. Mm -hmm. And as they spoke unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple... And the Sadducees came up on them. Now, the Sadducees was a sect of, of Jewish scholars. There were two at, the, at, at that time, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Pharisees uh, historically became what are now the rabbis in the synagogues. Okay? The Sadducees uh, basically you know, fell out of favor. All right? uh, part of the reason is they didn't believe in spirit, that you had a spirit. They didn't believe in angels. And they didn't believe that you resurrected from the dead. So, as, as the founder would say, they were sad, you see. Because <laughs> they had no hope. Okay? But, um, uh, uh, so, so, so they were, they, they, the Sadducees basically came upon uh, those that were with Peter, okay? And Peter himself. Go ahead. 
being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Yahshua the resurrection from the dead. See, they, they were grieved by what they were teaching. Okay, they were grieved that they had preached through Yahshua the resurrection of the dead. Okay, this is what they didn't believe in. Through Yahshua. Go ahead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day. In jail. For it was now eventide. Now see, what, what the, the crime that Peter had done was Peter and John, they went to the temple, and they went there a lot, okay, and they would preach and stuff like that. But this day, there was a man uh, who was basically uh, crippled from birth, and he was 40 years old. And his whole life, he laid at the temple gate, okay, uh, asking for alms. So every day, these priests and Sadducees and Pharisees would walk by this guy every day for 40 years. Now, Peter and John, they, they walked by him. And what happened was is the man uh, uh, basically turned to them and expecting to get alms from them. And Peter said, see, silver and gold have I none, but in the name of Yahshua, get up. Rise up. And, and so he was healed in the name of Yahshua at the temple. Now, who do you think this would make look really bad? Those priests that were walking by this guy for 40 years and couldn't do nothing for him. Okay? So they, they literally arrested him for healing someone. Okay? I work at a hospital. Okay, if the doctor gives somebody and they heal, it heals them, do they get arrested? <laughs> Up, throw them in jail, healing somebody. All right? So, so, so that's what they were arrested for. So they, they put them in jail until the next day. Okay, uh, verse 4, go ahead, keep going. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and mm -hmm. the number of the men was about 5,000. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass the following day that their rulers and elders and scribes and Hanan, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. Now these were the same ones that put Yahshua on the cross. This was, see, this, their, their government there, now they were, they were controlled by the Romans, but they had their own government under the Romans, and the government was a theocracy. Or in other words, that the, 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 the uh, religious leaders were the ones that ruled the people. And they had the power of life and death over everybody. Okay, go ahead. Seven, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? So they asked them, how would you heal this guy? By what power or by what name? Go ahead. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said unto them. Now who's speaking here? The Holy Spirit. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Go ahead. Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel but that by the name of Yahshua the Messiah. Now he didn't fool around. Of Nazareth. He said, if you want to know how we healed this guy, and I'm paraphrasing, it was by the name of Yahshua the Messiah. Go ahead. Whom? Of Nazareth. Of Nazareth. And he crucified. The one you crucified. Now he wants to make sure mm -hmm. that they knew which one. See, Yahshua. Okay, you, now, now you'll, you'll notice that Yahshua sounds like Joshua. Okay. This was a common, this is a common name. Okay. Because a lot of people name their children after, after Joshua back here, who was actually Yahshua. Or if you actually investigate it more, it was Yahoshua which means Yahweh will be salvation, mm -hmm. as opposed to Yahshua, which means Yahweh is salvation. All right? So the one that, 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 you, that, that you crucified, go ahead. Whom Yahweh raised from the dead. The Yahweh raised from the dead. Even by him doth this man stand here before you hold. Uh-huh. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. Now this was the stone which was set at naught of you builders. Which has become the head of the corner. Uh-huh. Neither is there salvation in any other. Now, this is Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, that gives them some cred, right? All right. This, this is my name, 
this is his name forever. forever. Now we're part of forever, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. This is it. This is the name whereby you must be saved. Okay? And it, it's, it's pretty plain. Now here's the thing. You go to your minister. You go to your priest or your rabbi and you ask them if these are the true names. And they will tell you that they are. Okay. Now, I'll admit, when I went to my preacher, when I was a teenager, when I came into this class, and I asked him if he knew the name of Yahshua, he said he never heard it before. Now, two weeks earlier, Chuck had gone to him and told him the name of Yahshua. So he flat out lied to me. All right. See, I didn't realize it, but I had been lied to when it came to religion. Now, this is such a shock, right? Okay. Out here in the world, I mean, politician, the word politician is almost synonymous with liar, isn't it? Okay. Both sides of the aisle. Okay. You've been lied to by the politicians. You've been lied to by, about economics, the politics. Is it such a shock that the religious leaders, okay, are lying to the people? I mean, look at what's happened to the Catholic Church, all right? This phenomenon of pedophilia is worldwide mm -hmm. and is rampant. And instead of getting rid of these priests, they just moved them from one place to the other, these bishops. The bishops were just as bad or worse knowing what these people were doing. And then, the, the, then all of a sudden it's coming out that the Baptists are getting caught. And then, I mean, here in Tampa, okay, we had a Reverend Lyons. <laughs> he was lying. Yeah, yeah. Lying the whole time. Yeah. He's back at it yeah. and has followers. A convicted criminal. See, people will, they, they tend to believe what they want to believe. There are a few that really, I mean, I remember when I was in college, I had a friend uh, who was telling me how that she really wanted to know what the truth was about the world and stuff like that. So I, I said, well, I can help you out. And so I told her about these names. I told her about how that the creation operates according to a pattern that was given in the Bible, that history repeats itself according to that pattern, the scriptures go according to that pattern, okay? And I told her about some other stuff that I'm going to get into. And when I got all done, and this is about a two-hour conversation, she said to me, she said, if that's the truth, I'd rather believe the lie. That's how people react when you tell them the truth. You know, I mean, people, <laughs> you know, lately about the conspiracy theories, they're talking about how people love conspiracy theories. Okay. This is the biggest conspiracy going. All right. If you love conspiracy theories, they conspired, someone conspired, all right, to get rid of these names. Now, go to Philippians, uh, uh, it's either 2 and 5 or 2 and 9. Now, I want to talk about the important, uh, uh, another aspect of the importance of these names. That, that these names are important in, uh, for you to, to uh, truly understand what's being discussed in the Bible. All right, but read this here in Philippians. Name above every name? Yes. Philippians 2 and 9, wherefore Yahweh also... Highly exalted him. He's highly exalted Yahshua. Go ahead. And given him a name which is above every name. Given him a name which is above every name. Go ahead. That at the name of Yahshua every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Every, that's, it, that's, that's pretty much, things in heaven, that's the angels. Things in earth, that's us. And things under the earth are the people that have died. 
So everybody's going to bow to that name Yahshua, one way or the other. And Karen brought this out, how that there's a, a, a structure, part of the corpus callosum in the brain called the genu, which is Latin for knee. So I'm not talking about that you're going to have to get down on your knees, okay? Um, we're talking about bowing, you see, here, you see, in your mind or in your spirit, you see. Now, um, I'm going to take, pardon? Did you want Acts? Acts 17? Uh, I'm going to get back to Acts. Okay. okay, I jumped the gun with, with that, but I do want to get back to that. Now, out here in the world, okay, they have something, and, and, and these, uh, I'm going to get back to these names, but they have something called the Trinity. All right. Now, the Trinity is a concept that came about about 300 years after the death of the Messiah. So 300 years. See, that, that, that wasn't even used, okay, until approximately three centuries after the death of the Messiah, the word Trinity. Now, Sherry knows the Bible about as good as anybody I, I know. Okay, Sherry, would you find me the scriptures that talk about the Trinity? I can't. Why not? They're not there. Not there. <laughs> the word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Now, you can find scriptures that say unity, right? Mm -hmm. All right, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. All right, now, Yahweh says that I am a unity. That's in Deuteronomy. He says, I am Yahweh, a unity. It doesn't say Trinity. The word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible. And what happened was, is this is when the, the basically uh, the beginnings of the Catholic Church. Now, again, we're not down on Catholics. I'm just giving you the history of the thing. All right. The Catholic Church had a problem. There were people that believed in the unity of the Godhead. Okay. And the Godhead is the Father, the, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what that's. That's what the Godhead is, all right? And I'm going to explain that to you. But um, some believed it was a unity. Some believed it was a duality, or in other words, two. And some believed that it was three, and that that was the Trinity. Now, it just so happens that the emperor of the Roman Empire believed it was a trinity. So when they voted at, the, at what was called the Council of Nicaea, which was in a, pla in a city called Nicaea in Asia Minor, okay, uh, it was a Greek city and uh, was under the control of the Roman Empire. So they had this council and they voted on this and, and they voted on other things. So that all the Catholics, which was pretty much the only religion at that time, were to preach the same thing. And, they, and at that point in time, they voted that the Trinity was the way that, 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 that God was, his supernal nature or his Godhead, even though the word Trinity doesn't even appear in the Bible. It doesn't even appear in a Catholic Bible, all right? So the Trinity's one. Now, the people that believed in the duality and the unity, they killed them. All right, there was a large uh, uh, faction of those that believed that, all right, in the, uh, in the church in Egypt, uh, the Coptic church now, okay, but it was part of the Catholic church at one time, and that they believed in a duality and, in a unit, and some of them believed in the unity, and they just went in there with soldiers and just killed them, all right? Now, the... Trinity is described, and I have here, um, technology is wonderful, okay, it's explained, and this is the way that it's explained, if you're a Catholic, you're probably familiar with this, in what's called the Baltimore Catechism. Now, uh, uh, it, it's in Lesson 3 on the unity and Trinity of God. Okay, question 180, what does unity and what does Trinity mean? Answer. 
Unity means being one, and Trinity means threefold or three in one. Can we find an example to fully illustrate the mystery? They love that word mystery. See, if they say something's a mystery, they don't have to explain it. Can we find uh, an example that to fully illustrate the mystery of the Blessed Trinity? Answer, we cannot find an example to fully illustrate the mystery of the Blessed Trinity because the mysteries of our holy religion are beyond comparison. <laughs> That's an answer? Okay. That's just confusion. All right. Um, question 182. Is there one God? Yes, there is one, but one God. Okay. Let me uh, skip down a few. Okay. Um, question 186. How many persons are there in God? In God, there are three divine persons, really distinct and equal in all things, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, uh, this, is, this is an electronic version, so it doesn't have the pictures, but they, they give you uh, illustrations, all right? And this is what they do. They put God in the center, okay? And they have Father, then they go the Son, and then they have the Holy Spirit. And this is how they des describe this Trinity. And then they put a line between the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son, and then the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then they put some words in here. They say that the, the God is that the, the, I'm sorry, that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. We're okay so far, right? Then they put on these outside lines, they put is not. But the Holy Spirit is not the Father. The Father is not the Son. And the Son is not the Holy Spirit. Are you confused? Of course. You should be. Okay. This is how they describe it. Okay. Now, now let me continue on. All right. Um, how many persons in God? We got three divine persons: uh, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Is the Father God? The Father is God and the first person of the Blessed Trinity. Is the Son God? The Son is God and the second person of the Holy, Holy Trinity. Is the Holy, Holy Ghost God? The Holy Ghost is God and the third person of the Blessed Trinity. Okay. What do, we, what do you mean by the Blessed Trinity? By the Blessed Trinity, I mean one God and three divine persons. Are the three divine persons equal in all things? So the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son are... are uh, um, equal in all things. Are the three divine persons one and the same God? The three divine persons are one and the same God. Okay. Uh, okay. Can we fully understand how the three divine persons are one and the same God? Answer. We cannot fully understand how the three divine persons are one and the same God because this is a mystery. Another mystery. <laughs> All right, what is a mystery? A mystery is a truth which we cannot fully understand. Okay. I mean, except for the word truth. <laughs> Say, so how about a mystery is a lie that we cannot fully understand. Now, this is what's taught out here in the world. And as I said, this is not what's in the scriptures. All right, it says in the scriptures, in Deuteronomy, it says Yahweh is a unity. Now, let's go over to uh, uh, John 1 and 1, please. John 1 and 1. Uh -huh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Yahweh, and the Word was Yahweh. Okay, now, the question is, is, is what is the Word? Mm -hmm. Okay, go over to... Uh, um, um, 
uh, Genesis, uh, I think it's uh, 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 chapter 15. Yeah. Okay. And then I want um, over there in, in 1 Samuel, uh, uh, third chapter, verses 1 and then verse 21. Just the first verse. All right. After these things, the word of Yahweh. Okay, now read it a little slower than that. So this is back with with Abraham. All right. Now with it, it's actually over here on this chart, but uh, it's probably a little small for you to see. But this is with with Abraham. Now, back at the time of Abraham, which was you know uh, 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 millennia before the Messiah. All right. This is how Yahweh communicated with people. All right, go ahead, read, please. After these things, the word of Yahweh came under Abram in a vision. All right, now the word, which is the same thing as Yahweh Elohim, all right, that these terms, the word, the son, and Yahweh Elohim are interchangeable. Because in other places, it would describe Yahweh Elohim appeared to them, in, in saying, but it was also referred to as the word of Yahweh. Okay, now, when I was growing up a Baptist, all right, Baptist, Methodist kind of thing, all right, went to a Baptist church, then we went to the Methodist. There wasn't a whole lot of difference between them. Baptists got a little more excited, but other than that, they pretty much taught the same thing. I was taught that this was the word of God. All right, now, the, this is not, now, if this is true, if this is the word of God, then the word of God came to Abraham in a vision saying, okay, hey, Abraham, all right, is that what happened? No. Now, these are the words of Yahweh, all right, I agree with that, but this isn't the word singular. The word of Yahweh appeared to Abraham in a vision. This was a visionary shape and form of a man. And he would appear. Now you'll read that. It, 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 like if you look in the first couple of verses of Isaiah. The word of Yahweh appeared unto me saying. In, in the Jeremiah. The word of Yahweh appeared unto me saying. All right. Now you have Samuel, right? You have Samuel? Yeah. Now did you want uh, 1 Samuel 3rd thir chapter? Yes. Yes. Okay. The Shiloh. The first verse and the 21st verse. First verse and the okay. Yep. Okay. On um, Samuel three and one. Mm -hmm. And the child Samuel. So Samuel was a prophet. Mm -hmm. So this is this is about uh, uh, you know uh, like five centuries after after Abraham, and Samuel was a prophet of Yahweh, and he was a child at this time. Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead and read, please. And the child Samuel ministered unto Yahweh before Eli. And the word of Yahweh was precious in those days. Now, yeah, the word of Yahweh, not the speaking of, speaking part, but the, this visionary shape and form of a man known as Yahweh Elohim, or the word, was precious in those days. He wasn't appearing to people very often at this time. Go ahead. There was no open vision. Now, again, it says that the word of Yahweh... Just like I said with Abraham, was a visionary shape and form. It wasn't flesh and blood. It was the visionary shape and form of a man. And it was called the word for this reason. He spoke to them. He communicated with them. So it was referred to by that title as the word of Yahweh. Now read verse 21. 21. And Yahweh appeared again in Shiloh, for Yahweh revealed himself. Samuel in Shiloh by the word of Yahweh. So Yahweh revealed himself to Samuel by that word of Yahweh. All right, now go over to uh, Exodus um, where it describes Yahweh Elohim. I think it's the 20, 24th chapter. Um, yeah, 24.9 Yeah. Okay. Exodus 24.9. Exodus 24, 9. Uh -huh. Then one of Moses and Aaron, Nabab, and Abihu, and so many of the elders of Israel. Now, see, this is uh, like like uh, Yulia was saying. 
uh, uh, that, that, that these charts are uh, pictorial illustration. So this is describing the, the, the children of Israel's trek from Egypt through the Red Sea, the wilderness of Sinai, where they abode here for 40 years. And uh, uh, you have, uh, 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 start over again, please. Then one of Moses and Aaron. So you have Moses, his brother Aaron, go ahead. Nadab and Abihu, which were the sons of Aaron. Go ahead. And 70 of the elders of Israel. And 70 of the elders of Israel. They came up uh, up to this plateau part of this mountain. All right. And now, now look, they're looking up at something. Go ahead. And they saw the Elohim of Israel. So they saw Yahweh Elohim, or the word of Yahweh. These are synonymous. The Yahweh Elohim and the word of, of Yahweh. Now, now look at You ever notice that in the King James Bible, sometimes it says Lord. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it says God. And then sometimes it says the Lord God. All right. Now the reason why it says the Lord God is because what originally was in the text, and you can find that in a Holy Name Bible, you can look this up. What originally was there was Lord replaced Yahweh and God replaced Elohim. So when it says the Lord God, what it originally said was Yahweh Elohim. Or in other words, this visionary shape and form, which is referred to by the title of the word of Yahweh. They're one and the same thing. Yahweh Elohim and the word of Yahweh are the same thing. So that's why it says the Lord God. See, I thought they were just being emphatic. Okay, so to make sure you knew who he was talking about. But no, there were specific names that were replaced. Okay, that those names were taken out. And that these other names were placed in there to substitute. And can you see how by taking out those names, you lost the meaning? You d when you saw the Lord God, did you think of Yahweh appearing in a visionary shape and form? Because that's what that is. It's a description. Now here's the description of what they saw. Go ahead and read in Exodus. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. So all these guys, okay, 74 people, saw Yahweh Elohim. And he had feet, right? Go ahead. And they saw a heavenly body. They saw a, a, a incorporeal is the term. Or in other words, it's not flesh and blood. So they saw this incorporeal visionary shape and form. Which, go ahead. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel... He laid not his hands. So he had hands, he had feet, he had a body. All right, go ahead. Also they saw Yahweh Elohim and did eat and drink. Okay, so they saw Yahweh Elohim, and then he spoke to them from that mountain. So this was Yahweh Elohim, or the word, is being described there. And, and you read down through, you know, in the Old Testament, so-called Old, Old Testament. All right, that wherever it talks about the word, it's talking about this visionary shape and form of a man referred to as Yahweh Elohim. That's Yahweh appearing in a visionary shape and form, communicating with mankind. All right, now go back to John 1 and 1, please. In the beginning was the word. So in the, in the beginning, now look at <clears throat> If you read Genesis 1 and 1, read, read Genesis 1 and 1. Genesis 1 and 1. Uh huh. In the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth. Okay. In the beginning, Elohim, Yahweh Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Okay. So, now, this was explained on Sunday, and, and, and if you, it, it really was a beautiful lecture on Sunday. That was just an amazing class. Okay. Where, where, uh, 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 Dennis uh, um, explained, you see, he talked about this, this uh, uh, Genesis that Moses saw. Now look at, in the first, it talks about in the first day, 
and it talks about the Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And then the first day, you see, you, you see, you had uh, the earth was out without form and void, darkness upon the face of the deep. Then he separates the waters. He does he 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 does all these things for four days. Okay, on the third day he brings forth the plant life, and then on the fourth day it comes in, he creates the sun. Now wait a minute. How can you have days without the sun? Because our day is marked by the rising and the setting of the sun. Is that right? See, what Moses received up here, okay, uh, 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 and, and get me uh, um, Psalms 33 and 6. All right. What Moses saw here, see, this was seven days for Moses. He was up on this mountain for 40 days. And during seven of those days that he was up here on the mountain having this vision, and this is in your book, you just have to read it, all right, he received what was written in Genesis. Now, if you look, now I never noticed this when I was out in Christianity, I never noticed that it says right there, all right, um, Nancy, what does that say right there on, on the top? The first book of Moses called Genesis. Who? The first Moses. Book of Moses. Moses wrote Genesis. Now, how could Moses write Genesis? Now, if you ask your priests that, they'll say it was campfire stories. It was passed down from generation to generation. Well, you ever play that game where Someone will like tell you, tell you a story, and, tell you and it goes around the room. Call it a Chinese telephone. <laughs> a Chinese telephone. <laughs> okay. How how accurate does it when when it gets to Lawrence? Okay, when it goes through the room and gets to Lawrence, how accurate is that? About a third person, it's gone. That's gone. Okay, especially if it's a complicated story, which which this was. Okay. Now Yahweh didn't leave it up to mankind to remember things all that Moses wrote Yahweh showed him in a vision when he was up in this mountain including the Genesis now Moses okay now now um, football season starting right okay they changed the rules all right so that they can do slow-mo and find out you see, the, like, like what happened to poor New Orleans last year, okay? Um, what happened, okay? Uh, you see, they, they put it in slow motion, okay? That's not, this explanation to Moses is not how it happened. This is how it was explained to Moses. Now, how did it happen? Read Psalms. Psalm 33 and 6. By the word of Yahweh. So, it is by the word of Yahweh or Yahweh Elohim. Go ahead. Yahweh were the heavens made. Were the heavens made. Go ahead. And all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. By the breath of his mouth. Okay. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as a heap. Mm -hmm. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Uh-huh. Let all the earth fear Yahweh. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Keep going. For he spake. Now this is how it happened. He spoke. Mm -hmm. And what happened? And it was done. And it was done. See, he didn't like fool around for seven days creating the creation. Now, physics backs this up. You've heard of the Big Bang Theory. Instantaneous genesis. The universe came into being in an instant. You see, Yahweh Elohim, he, when he spoke, this creation came into existence. All right. Now this is the word of Yahweh. So in the beginning, that John is talking about, see, is not the same beginning that Moses is talking about. Moses is talking about in the beginning of the vision that he had when he was up in this mountain. And seven days of that vision was spent showing uh, Moses how Yahweh created the creation. The remaining 33 days was spent showing Moses how to construct this tabernacle. All right? Now, 
that, that shows you the importance of that tabernacle. Now, uh, now do you have anything else? He spoke. Uh, okay, no, that was it. And, he, and it stood fast. Mm -hmm. He commanded, and there it was. Now, go back to John 1 and 1, please. So this is John. Now, John's talking about the actual beginning. All right, go ahead. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning. In the very beginning of this creation was that word of Yahweh. Go ahead. And the word was with Yahweh. And the word was with Yahweh. And the word was Yahweh. And the word was Yahweh. All right. Now, we know what Yahweh Elohim is. We know what the word of Yahweh is. But what is Yahweh? What is he re referring to? Now, go over to Acts 17, chapter. Now, I was going to read through the whole <laughs> thing in Acts, but... Um, I, I, don't th I don't think I'm going to have, uh, uh, no, I won't have time. I always think I'm going to have time, uh, and I never do. All right, so go over to Acts 17 chapter. Okay, yeah, uh, pick it up at 22. So this is Paul, he's in Greece, all right, he's in Athens, and he's speaking to the Athenians, and it says that they spent nothing but to tell or to hear some new thing. So when Paul showed up, they were like, wow, this is, you know, they were all ears. Something new. All right, go ahead. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill uh -huh. and said, ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Now why would he say that they're too superstitious? Go ahead. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription. Now all over the place there were altars to Athena, to Zeus, mm -hmm. to Aphrodite, mm -hmm. okay, to all these gods and goddesses, and they all had names, all right? Then he comes across this one altar that's different, and, uh, and, he's, and he says, you guys are too superstitious. Why? Go ahead. I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown god. To the unknown god. All right, go ahead. Who, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Now, see... Their thinking was this. They had all these gods, but just in case they missed one, <laughs> they set up an altar to the unknown god. And they worshipped the unknown god because they didn't want the unknown god to get them. All right? So that's why they did it. But Paul, taking advantage of this, you see, sees this altar to the unknown god and what does he say? Him declare I unto you. I'm declaring this unknown God to you. Go ahead. Yahweh that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is ruler of heaven and earth, uh -huh. dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Now, now, Yahweh dwells not in temples made with hands. So we got a little church down here, and, 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 and they say that's God's house. Well, is he on the deed? Nope. All right. Is he paying the rent? Okay. I've been, now, I've been to the Vatican, okay? And that, that was about, uh, uh, you know, we went there on a vacation, had to see it. All right. The Vatican, St. Peter's Basilica, is enormous. The pillars surrounding the piazza around it are like, I don't know, like 20 or 30 feet in diameter. And they're like 50 feet high. You've been there, right? And they're made of marble. Where did you get all that marble? People died for it. They did, you see? It, it, and it's, it's incredible. And, and I don't know what, it's like 100, 200,000 or a million can fit in that piazza. Now, I just want to throw this one thing out to you. In the middle of that piazza, is a fountain mm -hmm. and in the middle of that fountain there's an obelisk and you know what's written on that obelisk I can't tell you because it was Egyptian hieroglyphics they actually have an Egyptian obelisk that they stole from Egypt in St. Peter's Basilica in the in the piazza mm -hmm. now when you walk into St. Peter's Basilica I mean these doors are everything is huge and the marble, you see, and the, the, everything is just beautiful, all right? And then they have markings on the floor. Is that right, Judy? Yes. They had markings on the floor. And these markings tell you where 
all the enormous cathedrals in the world would fit inside St. Peter's Basilica. That's how big it is. All the cathedrals of the world, okay, not all at the same time, but each one would fit within that. All right? So uh, my son was about, I don't know, five or six years old maybe at that time. And so, so he goes, he, he, he says to me, hey, hey, Dad, look at this. There's a window. And there, there was this huge altar. Okay, it had Latin written all over it. And you look in, there was a little window. And in the window, there were bones inside. And I realized that every one of these altars were filled with dead popes. There was death everywhere. And then, you know, you go to the gift shop, right? And I was looking through this book on the history of the Vatican. The first couple pages, it said that the Vatican was built on the Roman necropolis. Okay, you zombie people, what's a necropolis? <laughs> it's the city of the dead. They built St. Peter's on the Roman necropolis. Now, this is some principles, folks. These are some principles as to, as to you know, what's going on from a spiritual standpoint. And Yahweh made it this way. All right. He didn't tell them to build this tabernacle and put it on a graveyard or this temple or, or this, this ark. Those are the only three things that Yahweh ever commanded man to make, and he didn't leave it up to them. He gave them detailed patterns on how to construct those things. Okay, he didn't tell them to build St. Peter's Basilica. All right. Now, <laughs> so where am I? In okay, we're at 24. 24. Go ahead. Yahweh that made the world and all things therein, mm -hmm. seeing that he is ruler of heaven and earth. I love, pe I love, tell I'm sorry, I love telling people about the, 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 all the dead bones. Okay, it's just, <laughs> it's just, they're just telling on themselves. Okay, you know, and, and, and one, of, one of the, by the way, one, one of the altars was to St. Gregory, and Gregory is the one who messed up our calendar, all right? The calendar originally, in the, according to the scriptures, what was the first, first month of the year? April. April. Now, wouldn't that make sense? It's the beginning of a new year, okay? It's the time of resurrection, right? Okay, and but Pope Gregory... He changed the calendar. And he not only changed the calendar, but he made January the first month of the year, a time of death. All right, now I know we don't have death here in Florida, but I'm from the upper Midwest, all right? North Dakota, Wisconsin, Minnesota, okay? I can talk with the accent if you want. I can prove it, all right? But it's dead in the winter. You walk through the woods in the wintertime, and you know what you hear? You don't hear nothing. Because <laughs> it's dead and buried, you see? And, 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 and so, so, so he messed up the calendars. Now, the, they had his bones in the sarcophagus. It was all marble and stuff like that. And then they had a statue of him. And his feet were on the ground. And he's so revered that from people going to the statue and kissing the feet that it had worn away a huge portion of the marble. Can you imagine all the kisses it would take to wear that away? That's, they, they worship these popes. Now, the other thing that was interesting is, is see, a lot of these popes were from wealthy European families. And so on the sarcophagus, they had his family crest. And the symbol of his family was a dragon. All right? See, there's principles in this stuff. All right. Now, I'm sorry. I'm done with the, I'm done with the Pope, but go ahead. Yahweh that made the world and all things therein, uh -huh. seeing that he is ruler of heaven and earth, uh -huh. dwelleth not. So he doesn't dwell in, dwell in St. Peter's. Go ahead. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Worship with men's hands. Don't they do this? Okay. Even non-Catholics. Go past a Catholic church on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> she used to live in New Orleans. 
Who's not Catholic in New Orleans? I thought that was a real Catholic place. Okay. But, but go ahead. So he's not worshipped with men's hands as though... As though he needed anything. Oh, he needs your money, though. See, all the preachers, he needs your money. All right, go ahead. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. See, remember Terry, Terry Welsh, who's the dean of the Lansing class, he gave a beautiful testimony on how that... Uh, uh, he, he had a class in some other city, and they advertised, and four people showed up, two couples. And both the men were ministers. And when he started talking, they stopped him and said, look, you know, because he explained the names. He's, they said, look, religion is a business. That's what they told him. It's a business. Now, how good will your business be if you tell people things they don't want to hear? See? Sherry, you're the treasurer. What, what's my salary? I pay. I don't get paid. Okay, I pay towards the rent and stuff like that. Okay? Everybody chips in. Nobody gets paid. See? I don't... I don't want your money. I don't need it. Yahweh gave me a, a, a good job. I'm, I'm fine. You see? So guess what? I have no, as you can see from this room, I have no motivation to try to increase the attendance through flattery, through telling, telling you you're okay and I'm okay. Uh-uh. You're not okay, and neither am I. That's why we need a savior. Okay? I said okay. <laughs> Can't stop doing that. All right. Say all right for a while. Now, to the unknown God, go ahead. Whom therefore you ignorantly, ignorantly worship, I declare it to you. All right? Now, now, pick it up at 24 again. Okay. Yahweh that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is ruler of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Uh -huh. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Go ahead. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. See, he doesn't need anything from, from you. You need everything from him. And I do too. Go ahead. And hath made of one blood all nations of men. Mm -hmm. And dwell on all the face of the earth. Go ahead. And hath de determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Now look at back here with, with, with the children of Israel, Yahweh uh, appeared to them in, in the shape and form of a cloud. And, they, 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 and he led them up out of Egypt. And he got up on this mountain. And it says in the, in, the, in, the, in the fourth chapter of Deuteronomy, he tells them, he says, look, don't you make any image of anything. No, no image of a, of a man or a beast or anything. And he says, because you didn't see anything. He appeared to them in, in that cloud. All right? Now, so I'm going to draw a cloud. Now, read, read that again. Read that verse again. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. Okay. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Okay, now he is the source he is the substance. He has set our limits and our bounds of our habitation. All right, go ahead. That they should seek Yahweh, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Now it says here he's not far. I thought he was up above the sun, moon, and stars in heaven. An old guy, probably white. All right. <laughs> Reaching down, and, and it's, I, saw, I saw the picture of God in the Sistine Chapel. I, I actually made it in there. We had a visitor who didn't get to see it. All right. Very, very, very sanctified place. I walked in with a baseball hat, and I thought they were going to club me. <laughs> they told me to get that damn hat off. Don't wear a hat in there. And, and when you walked in there, you weren't allowed to talk. You weren't allowed to do anything. But you could look up and see what Michelangelo painted. And it's fabulous. 
And it's so funny. It's like a little teeny church or chapel in the middle of Vatican City. All right? And, and there they got God, and he's all you know, muscular. All right? Uh, and, and, you know, he's been doing that P90X. All right? <laughs> and Adam is reaching up to touch the finger of God. All right? Now, that ain't in your scriptures. It's a beautiful picture, but that's not the way it is. All right? Here, read, read, read it again. Okay, in Acts. Yahweh that made the world and all things therein, seeing his ruler of heaven and earth dwelt not in temples with, made with hands, mm -hmm. neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life, breath, and all things. He's source, substance, limits, and bounds. All right, go ahead. That they should seek Yahweh, if happily they might feel after him and find him. He's not far from every one of us. He's not like up up here in heaven. All right, go ahead. For in him we live. For where? In him. Right within Yahweh we live. Go ahead. And move. And move. And have our being. So here's you. Here's me. We live, move, and have our being within Yahweh. Now, this is what the founder said. The founder said that Yahweh came into this visionary shape and form, or Yahweh Elohim, all right? That he created Yahweh Elohim and then went out of the creating business. And then Yahweh Elohim spoke in the creation. And what did he use? The churches say that God made everything out of nothing. You can't find an example where something is made from nothing. You have to have some sort of substance. Now, we live, move, and have our being within Yahweh. And just as this cloud is around this chart, you see. Now, give me Jeremiah 23, 23, and 1 Kings 8 and 27. All right? And then there's, there's other places, too. But Yahweh is pure spirit. You can't comprehend him. He is made of, the, now what is spirit? Spirit as defined in the scriptures is knowledge. It doesn't say he has knowledge. It is knowledge. He is intelligence and wisdom, love, beauty, justice, foundation, power, and strength. He is made up of nine divine attributes. And he is that spirit of Yahweh. Spirit is something. Spirit uh, the founder of this class says, Spirit is more real than you are. This is the example. This is the reality that we're going to go back to. All right? So Yahweh, we live, move, and have our being within him. Is that what it said in Acts? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, what does it say in Jeremiah? Jeremiah 23, 23. Uh-huh. Am I an Elohim at hand, saith Yahweh? Am uh -huh. I an Elohim afar off? All right. Can any hide himself in secret places? Can you hide in secret places? That I shall not see That him? I won't find, find him or see him? Go ahead. Saith Yahweh, do not I fill heaven and earth? It says he Yahweh. fills heaven and earth. The universe is made of Yahweh. He is the source. He is the substance. He is the limits and the bounds of everything. Now, this is in your scriptures. Okay, now do you have 1 Kings? Mm -hmm. Now, this is when David was given the pattern for Solomon's temple. Now, David didn't make the, make the temple, okay, but, but, but the, he was shown this pattern. Go ahead. 1 Kings 8 and 27. But will Yahweh indeed dwell on the earth? See, it seemed unfathomable to him because he knew Yahweh. That Yahweh is going to dwell on the earth. Go ahead. Behold, the heavens and heaven of heavens. The heavens and the heavens of heavens cannot what? Contain thee. Cannot contain thee. Go ahead. How much less this house that I have built it. And, and this house was fabulous. Okay. It was covered with, it was gold plated. <laughs> it was the it was covered with with precious stones and gems. You see, you could not even look upon it during the 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 the, the middle of the day because of the reflection off of it. It was breathtaking, and yet 
Yahweh, see David knew yeah, the heavens and the heaven of heavens cannot contain Yahweh. Now go back to John 1 and 1, please. So in the beginning of this creation was this word of Yahweh. Go ahead. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with Yahweh. The word was with Yahweh. And the word was Yahweh. And the word was Yahweh. So look it. Now it didn't take all of Yahweh to make Yahweh Elohim. What he did is, is he came down. He divested himself of that glory and came down into this visionary shape and form, which spoke in the creation, all right, and which appeared to the prophets and to Moses and all of those back here, all right. So in the beginning, was, you see, uh, was the word, in the beginning of this creation, the word was with Yahweh, and the word was Yahweh. Go ahead. The same was in the beginning with Yahweh. All, all things were made by Yahweh. All him. things were made by Yahweh Elohim. Go ahead. And without him was not anything made that was made. Without him was not anything made that was made. Now what did he use? He used the substance of the Father. All right. Now, by the way, Yahweh's not a man. This name Yahweh, Yah is masculine. Way is feminine. He's both masculine and feminine. All right? That's how he could create the creation. You can't make a creation or a child, okay, without both sexes. But he is both male and female within himself and has that generative power to bring in the creation. So in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with Yahweh. The Word was Yahweh. All things were made by Him. Go ahead. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Go ahead. In Him was life. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. Wait a minute. I thought Jesus was the light of men. Go ahead. And the light shineth in darkness. Uh-huh. And the darkness comprehended it not. Now, so you have Yahweh Elohim. Now read verse 14. And the word is made The same word, not a different one, the same word was made flesh, go ahead, and dwelt among us. And, dwelt among us. and we beheld his glory. Okay. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now we have a saying. If you want a job done right, do it yourself. yourself. See, Yahweh didn't send his little boy down here. Now, I have a son. He, he's a big monster boy now. He's 23 years old. All right? But I wouldn't send him into a, a place. Now, see, Yahweh knew this was going to happen. This was, and you've got to come back for this. This was predicted all the way through the Law and the Prophets, all the way from the, the lamb that was offered up in this tabernacle, you see, to the lamb down here in Egypt, and all the prophets, all the scriptures point through a death, burial, and resurrection, and then the Messiah comes in and goes through that death, burial, and resurrection. This was not a surprise. Didn't he tell the apostles that this was going to happen? It was preordained to happen. Now, if this was... If, let me put it this way. If I was Yahweh, I would not send my son to a certain death. I would go down there and die for him. He didn't send his little boy. This was Yahweh himself manifested in that body back here. Okay. Now, Chuck got Romans 1, 19 and 20. Did you, Chuck? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, Romans 1, 19 and 20 states that the physical, see, see it, it talks about how, uh, uh, just get it. <laughs> uh -huh. Because that which may be known of Yahweh uh -huh. is manifest in them. Is manifest in them. Go Yahweh ahead. Yahweh had showed it unto them. He showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him. For the invisible things of Yahweh. Go ahead. That's from the, spirit. From the creation of the world. Right from the creation of the world, the place that we live in. Go ahead. Are clearly seen. Are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made. Now let me give you an example. 
We can understand Yahweh by the things that are made. All right? Now you have Yahweh, pure spirit. It's abstract. You have Yahweh, Elohim, okay, in a visionary shape and form. This is intermediate. But he has shape and form, hands, feet, and the body. And then you have Yahweh, Yahshua, manifested in a concrete or physical body. All right? It's not a trinity. This is Yahweh, pure spirit, Yahweh Elohim, and Yahweh in a physical body. Now, let me give you the simplest example that I can think of. Water. This room right now is filled with water. <laughs> it's just the molecules are so far apart and are moving so quickly that I can't get a good swim. Okay? So that's water in a gas uh, or vapor. It's also referred to. All right? Now, you take... You, boy, I'll tell you. They keep the air conditioning where I work down so low, I have to wear a fleece jacket. All right? And, and I, I wouldn't be surprised sometimes if my, if my, my water, okay, it turned into ice. Now, if, if I take that water from, from my desk and I walk outside, what happens? It condenses. You see, we, we say, okay, it's sweating. I hope it's not sweating. <laughs> but we use that, those terms. Okay? You see, that water, you slow it down, and it, and, and it becomes a liquid. And you slow it down even further, and you get concrete. Now, this is spirit, right? Yahweh is spirit. Okay? Abstract. Then he slows himself down. See, that's what happens with these water molecules. They just slow down. He slows himself down into this intermediate shape and form, and then he slows himself down even further, you see, and comes down to the creation and finishes the job. That's what he said he came to do. He said he came to finish. Now, I'll tell you what he came to finish another time. All right? We don't have time for that. Now, same spirit, same what? Now, the water molecules don't change. Okay? If they changed, okay, then you'd have... If they split up, all right, it's called nuclear fusion, okay, or fission, all right? So it's the same water molecules, gas, liquid, solid. It's just that simple, okay? Now let me give you just a slightly more complex, okay, example, all right? Because I, 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 I love working with the sciences, okay? Now... We talked about that pattern. You guys saw a video on it. But you have most holy place, holy place, court roundabout. Yahweh, and he dwelt here in, in, the, in, in the form of a cloud. That he appeared in that cloud between the wings of the archangels. And then you had, see, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim. This is intermediate. Only, only the priest could come in here. And then the court roundabout. And this is where the sacrifices were offered up. See, one, two, three. How many tabernacles? One. One tabernacle. You have a head, chest, abdomen, three parts. How many bodies? One, One body. Okay. Now, the way the cell works, you, you have a nucleus, a nucleolus, and a, and a cytoplasm or cell body. But see, that's not how it works. The way that it works is you have DNA... messenger RNA, and you have the ribosome. Now, when we think of DNA, we think of chromosomes. All right? Chromosomes only come together when a cell is going to divide. That's not the natural state of the DNA. The natural state of the DNA is, see, if this was the nucleus, it would be like this. It's a cloud. 
It's all relaxed. It forms a cloud in the nucleus. Now within that DNA is the blueprint of everything. All right? It's all that there is. It's the source. It's the substance. It is the limits and the bounds of you. This creation. All right? It's all contained within that DNA. Your gifts, your problems are all contained in that DNA. You see? You can't, you can't get away from it. Now, in this state, it cannot be understood. So what it does is, is piece by piece, it sends down a messenger RNA, okay? And this messenger RNA, it doesn't take all the DNA to make this R messenger RNA. It's just a messenger. And the process is called transcription, which means to write. And usually what it means, as far as the definition, is to take uh, some words from one language and bring them into a language that you understand. So this DNA sends this messenger down here. It's the same message that's in the DNA. Like I could even put that, that it's the same in the message. Now what that messenger RNA does is it gets into a ribosome. It just goes right into the ribosome. And it's at this point in time that it's translated. Or you get, a, and that's the process. It's called translation. Right. Now look at, here you have Yahweh. Incomprehensible, inscrutable. Only 3% of the DNA do we even know what it does. 3% of it, that's not much. Okay, if, if you date someone and say, well, I know about 3% of what they're thinking, <laughs> you, better, you better wait. <laughs> okay, so this is incomprehensible and inscrutable. The DNA is still incomprehensible and inscrutable. I work with this all the time. Okay, so it has to break itself down into an intermediate shape and form, and that is that messenger RNA. All right, and then this messenger RNA has to get Inside. Now, this ribosome is made of protein. This physical body is made of protein. So, this same spirit just got into a protein, a physical body. And that's where the translation occurs. You can't understand this. You can't understand this. But until that message is translated, and you're the translation of that DNA. You, your body. You see, see, Yahshua. See, somebody don't, they don't like Yahshua. They want to say, well, I, I'm, I'm Yahweh. I don't want to be Yahshua. Without Yahweh, without Yahshua, there's no translation. So thank you for the time. <laughs> Where did he go? <laughs> okay, a quick announcement before we dismiss. Um, if you hadn't made plans to go, you can't make them now because they're all filled up Albuquerque. So there's no, um, there's no more uh, room yet, no more space. But it's, uh, they do plan on broadcasting it live. So more information will be coming, all right? And um, we'd like to acknowledge again and welcome and uh, um, ask you to come back. Yeah. Our classes are held here every Wednesday from 7 to 9 and every Sunday from 11 to 1. Mm -hmm. Can all rise for the doxology? Taken from the last two verses of Jude. 
Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah.